Welcome to the Commercial Pilot Course Series, Part 1, Passing Your Checkride, Oral, and Written Knowledge Test. My name is Michael Carlini, Commercial Pilot, Flight Instructor, and Founder at OregonFlightSchool.com, and I'm glad you were here. Let's jump right into this short course. What follows are what might be the most effective methods of preparation to pass your Commercial Pilot Written Knowledge Test, Oral, and Practical Test. The goal of these methods is to result in your passing these tests on your first attempt. Coincidentally, these methods may also be the most low-cost ways to pass these tests. The preparation processes for your commercial pilot tests are the same as any other rating you have acquired. There's no way around it. You need to put in the work, the hours, the hand cramps from your pencil, or so at risk from typing notes. You cannot bypass it. Anyone selling you a course that claims that their spoon-feeding of information is going to result in your success is lying, and this is because that's not how the human brain works. If it was, Every college student on earth could simply watch Khan Academy calculus videos and they'd get straight A's in the class without ever picking up a pencil. If you are not willing to put in the time and effort at this stage of your flying career, then it might not be a good career for you. You will need to be able to self-study regardless of where your pilot career aspirations lie. If you don't know how to self-study, don't worry. That will be covered shortly. While time and effort are certainly required to learn anything well, I am a major proponent of the work smarter, not harder philosophy. What do I mean by this? There's a seemingly infinite amount of information that you might find yourself studying in this line of work, yet a significant portion of that information is just not stuff that is necessary to know in order for you to do your job successfully as a pilot. For example, when you head to school for your first type rating, you will receive an aircraft training manual. This manual will probably be 400 to 600 pages in length and will cover each aircraft system in extreme detail, much of which is more relevant to engineers than pilots. This information is placed in the manual to provide explanations and context, but you are not expected to know every last detail. If you choose to learn every single bit of information in the book, you are going to grossly overwork yourself and valuable time will be wasted memorizing information that is not useful to you as a pilot. In other words, no matter what you are trying to learn, you would be wise to study the right information from the get-go and do so in the most efficient manner possible. OregonFlightSchool.com does produce full courses, including Part 2 of our Commercial Pilot Course series, which covers low-time flying jobs, and Part 3 of the series, which covers first-time co-pilot jobs. But when it comes to passing your tests, there is no reason to reinvent the wheel, which is why this short course points to certain outside resources and products instead of trying to create our own version of them. Products and resources we are about to recommend work, and that is why they are so popular and have stood the test of time. The total cost for the few purchases necessary is about $60, and this $60 is absolutely money well spent. Note that OregonFlightSchool.com was not compensated for including any of these products or resources in this course. You should know by now that the FAA written knowledge tests are a joke. There are a finite number of questions in the FAA written test question bank, and each question has three possible answers to choose from, of which only one is recognized by the program as the correct answer. Through a combination of the FAA's release of certain question banks to the public, as well as test takers who submit unreleased questions that they remembered from their tests, publishers have created study programs and books that provide, word for word, the questions, all possible answers, and the correct answer for practically every single question in the FAA's test question bank. The result is that the questions and answers you study in the study program are literally the exact same word for word as those on the actual tests. Thus, for those who have caught on to this and choose to use such study programs, the written tests become a test in rote memorization abilities and nothing more. The FAA Commercial Pilot Airplane Written Knowledge Test Study Solution, Shepard Air. If you're new to Shepard Air, their process is simple. The program takes advantage of the brain's ability to memorize information by frequent repetition. During the first phase of the program, Shepard Air takes nearly every single question from the FAA test question banks and repeatedly shows the user each and every question with only the correct answer shown. Next, they begin to include the incorrect answers alongside the correct answer, which is depicted as correct. Eventually, all possible answers are shown without giving away which answer is correct, but by that point, the user has seen the correct answer enough times to know that they can recognize the correct answer amongst the incorrect answers. If the user successfully completes the study program, they are usually able to recognize each question after reading just the first few words of the question during the test, and they can immediately spot the correct answer. 
Some test takers have reported completing the test in a matter of minutes with 100% accuracy using Shepard Air. As you might guess, Shepard Air's study method has nothing to do with learning the content of the question at all. While the program does provide written explanations for each question to help you learn the information, the primary goal of the program, and the most effective use of it, is not the user's learning of the information. If you follow their study methods exactly, you will almost certainly pass the test the first time, and you will probably spend a minimal amount of time studying. The actual information that a commercial pilot applicant needs to know and understand can be learned more effectively through their studying for the oral exam, which will be covered shortly. The Commercial Pilot Airplane Shepherd Air program, as of this writing, costs $45 and is well worth the effectiveness and time savings it affords. Give yourself at least a couple of weeks, but not too long, to complete the program before taking your written test. When you have completed the Shepherd Air program, you might visit kingschools.com to take their written practice tests for extra practice. King Schools regularly updates their test banks. The most current ASA and GLIME written test prep books are also a good resource if you'd like extra practice or if you would like to truly learn the information through prepping for the written test. The oral portion of the commercial pilot checkride, study solution, the ASA oral exam guide. The ASA oral exam guides, simple and low cost as they are, are probably the most effective study tool for oral exam preparation. ASA offers them for all check rides, and they only cost about $15. They are a fantastic way to truly learn information, at least as well as one can learn from a book. In contrast to the FA written test, which, as discussed, is a test of rote memorization, it is extremely important that one actually learn and understand the material for the oral portion of the check ride. It needs to be fully understood to such an extent that you can explain it and draw connections between topics when prompted to do so by an examiner's question. Depending on the type of learner that you are, simply reading a book may not be the best method for studying the material. You may have to do more than just read the book. What worked best for me is a method that I came up with while studying for my instrument rating many years ago, and it is a method that I have since recommended to all of my students as the most effective way to study. To date, I have never failed any aviation-related test or check ride, and I credit the following self-study method for that success. How to self-study. If you are reading this, your study methods are probably, at the very least, sufficient. Indeed, they must be if you made it this far in your flight training career. But if you are looking for a different or better way to study, you might find my method to be of some use. This short lesson is actually a modified version of a popular blog post I published in 2018 at OregonFlightSchool.com. Though we are discussing this study method in regards to using the ASA exam guide to prepare for the oral exam, this method can be used with any book for any subject, including studying for a type rating. Remember that this is just one method that worked well for me and many other pilots, but it might not be best for you. If it doesn't work well, I encourage you to research other studying best practices until you find the one that works for you. Step 1. Read. Read the book cover to cover initially. When you read it, you are just becoming familiarized with the content. Don't get hung up on being able to answer all of the questions in the book. You will probably know the answers to some of the questions in the guide, but many of the questions will cover new material. Step 2. Highlight. Once you have read through the book once, go back through the guide and highlight everything you do not already know or, if applicable, information that you know to be critically important. Note that if you are questioning whether you know something or just might know it, you should highlight it. Be very liberal with how often you highlight, but do try to highlight only the minimum number of words that still effectively convey the information or question. Ideally, you will find keywords or phrases that summarize the point of whatever it is you do not already know. Step three, write it all down. So far, you've read through the book once and have gone back through and highlighted everything in the book that you did not know. In essence, what you've just done is taken an entire book of information and condensed it down into a highlighted list of everything you need to study. Out of the entire process, the next step is what I have found to be the most critical part. This next step involves taking everything you highlighted and writing it down in a notebook to create a study guide that is most relevant to you and your needs. This may sound time consuming, and it can be, but the physical act of writing everything down by hand is the key. You can also type out the information if you wish for the same effect. This process is what will imprint the content and knowledge into your brain. 
I would recommend buying a very durable binder and at least a couple hundred pages of loose leaf paper to place in the binder. Find a few good pens and head to your favorite coffee shop or wherever you will be able to stay focused and get to work. I encourage color coding if that helps, as well as drawing pictures and using Google to find clarifying answers to things that might not be clear to you in the book. Abbreviate, annotate, scribble, draw. Just make sure that what you write down is representative of everything that you highlighted in the book. I subdivide my notes by topic or chapters so that information is categorized for continuity. Once you have written out all the highlights in the book, you'll have your own personalized condensed study guide which contains all the information that you still need to study. Read each question or topic and try to recall the correct answer without looking. Don't be discouraged if you can't answer each question yet. You have the option of reading through the book and focusing on your highlights, or you might want to continue to study from your own notebook because it will be more streamlined. Remember that the process of writing the information down was the point, so even if your dog eats your entire notebook, you will have benefited from it already. Step 4. Read and Highlight Again After you have spent some time studying and quizzing yourself, go through your notebook and now highlight the material in your notebook that you do not know yet. You will notice progress because everything that you originally copied into the notebook was originally stuff that you didn't know. The less you highlight at this point, the more you have learned, and now you're going through the notebook and highlighting only the stuff that still needs further attention. Now you have an even more compact list of highlights, so that you can focus solely on the stuff that you don't already know. You can now write or type out these highlights into a new notebook and repeat as many times as necessary until you can read through the entire ASA guide and, and answer nearly every question correctly. I should emphasize that this method works for studying airline op specs, GOMs, and aircraft training manuals, pilot operating handbooks, and aircraft flight manuals as well. For example, while studying for my Part 135 Alaska bush flying job, I went through my Part 135 op specs and GOM and highlighted the most important information that I figured would show up on my 135-293 checkride. I also went through the training manuals during Cessna Caravan, Beach 1900, Hawker 800, and Challenger 601 SIC training and copied all the important topics into a notebook or Google Doc. I used this method for my citation and CJ type rating training and found it to be just as effective. My recommended study method in summary. Step one, buy the ASA guide. Step two, read through it all the way. Step three, go back and highlight everything you don't already know. Step four, write out all of your highlights in a notebook or Word document. Step five, go back and highlight everything in that notebook that you still don't know. Step six, write out all of those highlights in yet another notebook. Step seven, Repeat until you can answer all questions in the ASA guide correctly. The practical portion of the commercial checkride. It doesn't need to be said that flying the actual airplane is the only way to develop the field and precision for the commercial maneuvers, and there really is no substitute for this. But your time spent in the airplane will be made more effective if you show up already familiar with the maneuvers, which include the steep turn in a 50 degree bank, steep spiral, chandel, lazy eights, eights on pylons, the power off 180. Study solution, videos on YouTube. I found that watching free videos published by a number of great YouTube channels was the most effective way for me to learn these maneuvers on the ground. The videos I found explain each maneuver, give pointers, and provide visuals so you can see what the maneuver is supposed to be like. I recommend you search the channels listed here and watch their versions of each commercial pilot maneuver. Some channels do a better job with explanations and other channels do a better job with visuals. Watching multiple videos of the same maneuver should give you the best idea of how it is performed. Recommended channels include the UND Aerocast, Embry-Riddle Special VFR, M0A Flight Training, and Fly8MA.com. Many of these channels have compiled all of their commercial pilot content into playlists titled something similar to Commercial Pilot Video Playlist, so it shouldn't be too difficult to locate all of the videos relevant to your checkride. After watching them all, find your favorite, Watch it multiple times, then do so over a couple weeks as needed. I would advise taking notes. Write or type out everything there is to know about these maneuvers, and once you have a thorough self-written guide on each maneuver, repeat the highlighting and writing steps discussed in the previous section. Chair flying will also help prepare your brain for the actual aircraft. Most importantly, after you have attempted the maneuvers in the aircraft with your instructor, re-watch the videos and continue to study your notes and chair fly to really solidify the information in your brain. The most important information. A full and comprehensive understanding of your aircraft is necessary because it provides context when deciding how you will operate the aircraft and how you will deal with abnormal and emergency situations. 
However, this doesn't mean you're going to need to remember every single detail in the AFM. There is certain information that warrants more attention, and there is no sense in spending too much time and mental energy trying to retain information that isn't going to affect how you operate the aircraft. What do I mean by this? Here are some examples. There is no need to know the exact oil pressure at which the low oil pressure switch opens and illuminates a low oil pressure enunciator. While interesting to engineers and maintenance technicians, this information does not matter to you as a pilot. What matters to the pilot is the implications of this condition and what the pilot can do to resolve it. Knowing that there are 8 wing ribs in each wing or 34 fan blades on the low pressure engine fan is not useful information to a pilot. You won't need to count the number of blades in the engines to know if one is missing. Having an engineer's understanding of how the fuel control unit operates is not necessary. Just know where the unit is located in the fuel line and that it uses various sensors to deliver the correct amount of fuel to the engine. Done. Finally, there is no need to know the exact bleed air temperature at which the bleed air overheat enunciator will illuminate. Who cares? Here is what the pilot should know. When the enunciator illuminates, it means the bleed air coming out of the precooler immediately downstream of the engine is too hot, and it's time to pull out the abnormal checklist. That's it. Having a big picture understanding of the systems gives context and allows us to determine what other components may be affected, but that doesn't require knowing that this enunciator illuminates when the temperature probe sense 541 degrees Fahrenheit. I know for a fact that memorizing some of this information is unnecessary because I used to memorize it. With little guidance on exactly what to study, I would spend countless hours drilling this kind of information into my brain. When I went to school for my first typewriting, my instructors began to roll their eyes when I would ask a question that was digging too far into the minutia of a component or system. Half the time, they didn't even have an answer, which sometimes made them grumpy, and they would tell me that it's just not important. I listened to their advice, and life has been easier ever since. Certain details in the AFM should be used to aid in understanding a system, but not all of those details need to be memorized. If a situation arises in which I need more detailed information about a component or system, I can always go back to the reference books and open up that section. This approach to problem solving leads to more efficient studying during training and assures more accurate information when such precise details are necessary in flight. Still, you should be aware that, unfortunately, certain training programs and examiners may insist that you memorize particular information that may or may not be all too useful to you in the cockpit. You may have to bite the bullet and spend time memorizing a number or factoid just to appease an examiner during the oral exam, even if the information is always available to you in the cockpit. An example of this might be an oil temperature limitation that is depicted on the gauge. In my experience, and in the experience of countless other professionals, if you are asked a question on the oral regarding information that is always depicted somewhere in the cockpit, let the examiner know that the information is displayed on the gauge. It will probably work. The following list contains some useful kinds of information that you will want to commit to memory in no particular order. You should be able to recall all this information from memory every time you step into the aircraft. This list is a highlight of some of the most frequently used or critical information in any aircraft, but it is not fully comprehensive. Aircraft emergency memory items. Within the emergency checklist, memory items will normally be printed in bold, printed in red ink, highlighted, denoted with an asterisk, or they might be enclosed within a shaded box or outline. If there are no memory items specified, as might be the case in an older single-engine piston aircraft, a good rule of thumb is to memorize all emergency procedure checklists. In particular, engine failure during takeoff, after takeoff, or in flight, engine fire in flight and during engine start, and emergency descents. The condition implied by any red enunciator or warning light as well as its implications and the proper memory items associated with the enunciator, flap and landing gear speed limitations, aircraft icing, de-ice, and anti-ice limitations, turbulent air penetration speed and minimum icing speed, crosswind and tailwind limitations, altitude limitations, empty weight of the particular aircraft you are flying, as well as model weight limitations, including cargo compartment weight limitations, Ballpark power prop mixture settings for climb, normal cruise, and long range cruise. Maximum fuel capacity, usable fuel capacity, fuel burn rates and ballpark endurance. Battery voltage and engine starting limitations. Stalling speed and stall speed factors in a bank. How to operate the avionics GPS or FMS unit proficiently. 
and any squawks or known issues from previous pilots or previous flights. This list might look familiar to you. It is essentially sections 2 and 3 of every aircraft AFM, limitations and emergency procedures, respectively. As a side note relating to turbine aircraft, knowing these two sections of a turbine aircraft's AFM will carry you most of the way through the type rating oral section. There is a tendency for emergency checklists and memory items to be very wordy and long, which can make them appear more complex and more difficult to memorize. In reality, most emergency memory checklists are short, maybe three to five items in length, and each checklist item usually involves a single action, such as flipping a switch. While you are working on memorizing these checklists, try to simplify and condense each item down to one or two words. For example, a Cessna 182 emergency checklist might look like this. Engine failure during takeoff ground roll. 1. Throttle, closed. 2. Brakes, apply. 3. Fuel selector valve, off. 4. Magnetos, off. 5. Master switch, off. It is not particularly wordy or long as is, but a more efficient way to memorize it might look like this. Engine failure during ground takeoff roll. 1. Idle. 2. Brakes. 3. Fuel off. 4. Magnetos. 5. Master switch. In this case, the reduction of words doesn't really detract from the instructions. At this stage in your aviation career, the correct actions associated with each task is implied, and simply memorizing either the name of the switch or the action required is effective enough. Doubt during training is okay. One thing I can guarantee is that throughout your career, at certain points during your training, you will think to yourself, there is absolutely no way I will be ready in time. The idea that you could ever learn all that you need to learn and be as prepared as you need to be in time for your oral or your check ride or the first day on the job, it will seem so outrageous as to be laughable. You may be cursed with simulator sessions that begin at 11 p.m. and run until 4 a.m. The simulator might break and result in your training being suspended for weeks. You may have a bad simulator partner. You may be sleeping poorly. It may seem like the universe itself intends to put up a fight to your efforts to succeed. Ignore the fear of failure. Just keep working. Keep studying. Keep chair flying. If applicable, keep practicing your flows and callouts. Pay doubt no mind. Giving your true 100% will almost guarantee you to be successful. So long as you are giving that true 100%, there's truly no need to worry. Trust yourself. In the words of Shia LaBeouf's famous motivational speech, Do it! Just do it! If you are going through any kind of structured program, either through a Part 142 training center or a Part 135 training program, trust that it has been designed and tweaked over time as to provide for a high success rate. Remember, they want you to succeed. Your success helps them too. Reach out to instructors, supervisors, colleagues, mentors. If you are feeling overwhelmed, ask them for guidance or advice. As was the case in previous check rides, your instructors will not sign you off until they feel you are ready. When they do sign you off, trust their judgment. They're very attuned to the level of skill and knowledge required to pass. In any case, perfection is never required. While we don't want to accept performance that is less than what we are capable of, Evaluations and tests can create an environment that does not mirror real life, and humans being humans, the reality is that we might not behave nor perform as we would in real life. A 70% score will pass a written test, an 80% will pass an oral, and momentary deviations outside of ACS standards, if caught and corrected, will pass a practical test. Perform as you are asked to perform during training, and you will succeed. Conclusion Written, oral, and practical tests are nothing new to you at this point. But if you have struggled with them in the past, or if you are looking for a different approach to preparing yourself, the methods discussed in this short course are effective and affordable. They will take time, but they are also efficient in that they ensure you will be learning the right material, the stuff you need to know to pass each test, and in such a way that you are able to retain the information so that you pass each test on your first try. Unfortunately, none of the resources mentioned in this course, or any other course or book out there, discusses in depth the specific opportunities available to low time commercial pilots, how to find those jobs, or how to prepare for them. Further, commercial pilot courses fail to adequately cover the obstacles you are up against as a low time pilot in the labor market, 
how to make yourself more competitive, or the real challenges of being a commercial pilot that are beyond the check ride, including how to handle heavy external pressure imposed by bosses and colleagues, imposter syndrome, and the ultra taboo topic of mental health. In an effort to make up for this shortcoming and to provide actionable real world guidance for pilots working to bridge the gap between 250 and 1500 hours, including those of you who do not wish to become a flight instructor, OregonFlightSchool.com created part two of the commercial pilot course series titled Low Time Flying Jobs. On top of discussing the aforementioned topics, this course will also share skills, knowledge, and techniques that have been honed by hundreds of thousands of combined flight hours so you can take your flying to the next level. This course is also available as a 300 page hardcover or ebook, and it is titled The Pilot's Guide to Low Time Flying Jobs. Both the online video and book versions of the course contain nearly identical content, including a list of nearly 70 non-flight instructor, low-time pilot employers to whom you can apply, but the online video course version will contain some additional video content and visuals that would have been impossible to place into a book. Part 3 of the commercial pilot course series covers your first co-pilot job, and additional courses include single pilot jet flying, your first aircraft management job, and a course that covers flying a jet between the mainland and Hawaii. Visit OregonFlightSchool.com or visit the links in the description to learn more. Feel free to shoot over a message if you have any questions. Thanks for tuning in. Good luck and fly safe. Welcome to part two of the commercial pilot course series, Low Time Flying Jobs, your comprehensive guide to bridging the gap between 250 hours and ATP minimums. My name is Michael Carlini, and I'm an ATP certificated corporate pilot and flight instructor based in Oregon. Becoming a competitive candidate for low time flying jobs and successfully navigating the next 1,000 hours of your career requires knowledge and a set of soft and hard skills that commercial pilot training programs omit from their teach to the test curriculum. This course will provide you with the tools and information you need to find a job, get hired, and thrive as a professional pilot. Over the span of nearly seven hours together, we cover everything including how to overcome the obstacles you face as a low-time pilot, where to find the many job opportunities available to you, specific networking techniques, and how to prepare for your job once hired. You will learn the typical eligibility requirements, compensation, schedules, specific flying techniques, and FARs pertinent to each type of flying job. Contrary to popular belief, flight instructing is not the only viable time builder for low-time pilots. And because this course is designed to provide usable, practical information, you will be given the names of nearly 70 non-flight instructing employers to whom you can apply. But we don't stop there. To give you every possible advantage through this phase of your career, you will learn the most critical techniques, knowledge, and skills acquired over the course of 13 years and thousands of hours of flying, condensed into just a few hours. We will also cover the seldom discussed but most significant challenges to professional flying, including how to manage imposter syndrome, dealing with external pressure, making mistakes, and pilot mental health. This is the course that I wish had existed when I was a 250 hour pilot. I designed it for low time commercial pilots who, like me, were dissatisfied by the lack of guidance for low time pilots trying to build time towards ATP minimums. To that end, no stone is left unturned. I invite you to check out the course previews, and if you feel the course fits your needs, give it a shot. Deliberately priced at the low cost of a paperback book, if you do get through the course and feel that it wasn't worth it, all it takes is a single click to get your money back. You have nothing to lose. Thanks for tuning in, and I will see you inside. Commercial Pilot Course Part 3 Your First Co-Pilot Job in terms of career guidance, by and large, commercial pilots have been left to fend for themselves from the moment they pass the commercial or CFI checkride to the moment they hit ATP minimums. The course that you have nearly completed was created to serve this group of pilots. But there is another group of pilots that has been neglected. Those who get hired to fly as a co-pilot in a turbine-powered aircraft well before hitting ATP minimums. In particular, co-pilots flying for Part 91 operators. Very little training is required by law, see FAR 6155. And in some cases, such as when a co-pilot is hired solely as an extra set of eyes in an otherwise single pilot operation, no training is provided at all. Very early in my career, I was fortunate enough to get hired to fly for a Part 91 flight department in the right seat of a number of small and medium-sized corporate jets. And while the department always operated within the FARs and met the training requirements imposed by our insurer, the training that was provided did not give me the confidence that I desired. The only way that I was able to learn about the techniques and best practices of turbine aircraft operations was through years of learning on the job. In an effort to serve those who follow a similar career trajectory as mine, I created the course that I wish had existed when I was first hired for my first position as a co-pilot. 
I wanted a low time commercial pilot to be able to complete the course in a matter of hours and walk away with the tools and knowledge that might otherwise take years to acquire. For those of you seeking guidance specific to flying as a co-pilot, I invite you to check out part three of the commercial pilot course series, Your First Co-Pilot Job. This course will be released shortly after the release of part one and part two of the commercial pilot course series, and it will cover a number of topics including type ratings, aircraft systems, turbine aircraft performance, a very technically detailed walkthrough of the duties and roles of a co-pilot, and professional flying skills, knowledge, and tips specific to turbine-powered aircraft. To enroll or learn more, visit OregonFlightSchool.com.